Hi everyone, this is Sam with Wine News in 5. Today I'm going to give you an update on Frost in New Zealand, IWSR data on the US wine market, Vino Concha y Toro signing up to the bottle weight accord, China joining the OIV, and the passing of Yanis Botaris. First up, Frost in New Zealand. Julia Harding tipped me off last week to a widespread Frost event in central Otago. I followed up with Sophie Parker Thompson at Blank Canvas Winery, who wrote back saying that the region was well into spring growth when on the evening of November 3rd, temperatures in the area dipped to negative 2.5 degrees Celsius, 27.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And because there was no inversion layer, meaning a layer of warm air above a layer of cold air, frost fans weren't effective in protecting vineyards. Sprinkler systems, which coat new growth in ice and thereby protect the growth from temperatures below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit were effective, but many producers don't have access to that infrastructure. Those who don't are currently looking at between 20 and 90% yield losses depending on subregion. However, it's still early enough in the season that there is a possibility that vines may compensate by developing larger berries or bunches throughout the growing season. Other areas of the country also experienced low temperatures that weekend with gimlet gravels in Hawke's Bay dropping as low as negative 1.5 degrees Celsius, 29.3 degrees Fahrenheit, and a few isolated pockets in Wairarapa hitting sub-zero temperatures. Sophie closed her email saying, while this is going to reduce the likely quantity of wine produced in 2025, the quality should not be affected as producers are acting to ensure frost impacted vineyards are managed appropriately to maintain quality. I'm wishing all the growers in New Zealand luck and good weather for the rest of the spring and summer. On to new data on the US wine market. In 2023, total beverage alcohol sales in the US fell by 2.6% by volume. The latest data from the IWSR, an organization that collects data analytics and insights for the beverage alcohol industry, shows a further decline of 2.8% between just January and July 2024. All categories except ready to drink beverages, RTDs, saw declines, with wine seeing the largest decrease in sales by volume at negative 4%. The Wine and Spirits Wholesalers of America's SIP source reports show that there are very few pockets of growth. Prosecco has seen 2% growth and the 50 plus price segment has seen 1% growth. While I can't find the SIP source data from 2023, the Silicon Valley Bank report showed that in 2023, wine in the 50 plus price range grew at 2% by volume, so double this year's growth. I'm giving you these deeply depressing numbers because over the last few months, I've heard people dismiss the contraction in wine sales as a phase and say, yes, but premium sales are doing fine. I don't think this is a phase. Premium sales are softening and Gen Z and millennials are drinking less. The wine industry is going to have to adapt, but I do think there are some clear opportunities. Two months ago, WSCT reported that they had a 15% higher enrollment in their diploma program year on year. In 2023, 50% of people enrolled at all levels of WSET were enthusiasts. And then in August, Grandview Research reported that demand for wine tourism among international tourists is projected to grow 13.3% from 2024 to 2030. So consumers may be drinking less, but producers who cater to the current demand for education, tourism, and who can host events will seemingly be able to create alternate streams of income. On to a major new signer on the bottle weight accord. The multinational wine producer Vino Concha y Toro produces around 384 million bottles of wine annually. On November 13th, it was announced that they had signed the Sustainable Wine Roundtable Bottle Weight Accord and, in agreement with the accord, will reduce the average weight of the 750 milliliter still wine bottles they sell to 420 grams or below by the end of 2026. This is Excellent news. Right now, between 30 and 68% of the total carbon footprint of wine comes from the production and distribution of glass bottles because it takes energy to mine sand. It takes huge amounts of energy to melt sand or recycle glass, which means that even when a bottle is recycled, the carbon footprint is giant and the energy to transport something as heavy as glass is significant. While we need every producer on board with reducing glass bottle weight, it is particularly impactful when a producer as large as Vina Concha y Toro makes this commitment. On to China joining the OIV. On November 14th, the OIV, the International Organization of Vine and Wine, formally accepted China's application for membership. Once this, at, once this acceptance is ratified by Chinese authorities, the OIV will officially represent 51 countries and 85% of the world's planted vineyard area. 
This is important. The OIV represents a united front for internationally accepted standards for viticulture and vinification. China, which has the third largest planted vineyard area in the world after Spain and France, and is the eighth largest consumer of wine, will now be involved in creating and upholding these standards. Finally, the passing of Yanis Butaris. On November 9th, Greece lost a wine icon. Our managing editor, Tara Q. Thomas, writes, when Yanis and his brother Costantinos took over the family company Botari in the 1970s, he saw an opportunity to use the winery to support the many grape growers of northern Greece. The wines they made put Nausa on the world wine map and supported dozens of local farmers in the process. Yanis also plowed profits back into the vineyards, researching clones, soils, exposures to better understand Xenomavro, as well as planting other varieties to see what might take. He pioneered the Xenomavro Merlot blend. One of those experimental vineyards became Kiriani after he split off from the family winery in 1996. Kiriani remains one of the most forward-looking wineries in northern Greece, now under the guidance of his son, Stelios Botaris. Yanis is also the guy who said in the 1980s, let's check out Santorini, see if it's worth saving the vineyards from the tourism trade. Botari's Santorini winery led the island's winemaking revolution, training winemakers who would go on to open their own wineries, such as Yanis Paraskovopoulos of Gaia Wines and Haridimos Hazidakis. But Yanis did more for Greece than improve its wine scene. His pride in his region with its complex political and ethnic history played out in everything from the creation of Arcturos, a sanctuary for the local brown bear and wolf populations, to serious work in repairing the country's fraught relations with the neighboring Republic of North Macedonia and with Turkey, a move that once got him beaten up and hospitalized. He was deeply adored by locals who voted him in as mayor of Thessaloniki for two consecutive terms in his 70s. There he fought against corruption, supported LGBTQ rights, he founded and led the city's first pride parade, and revived the city's rich Jewish history. It had held the largest Jewish population in Greece until 1943. A slightly built, tattooed, earring-wearing chain smoker, he did things his own way with what always seemed to me a wonderful combination of intensity and humor." End quote. I have a Zeno Mavro from Kiriani that I'll be drinking tonight to toast the life of Yanis Butaris. That's all for this episode of The Wine News. If you enjoy this newscast and you'd like to see it continue, please subscribe to jancisrobinson.com. And if you have breaking news in your area, please email me at news at jancisrobinson.com. Thanks.